Okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 13 game main slate we have here on uh, Wednesday, June 28. Back to back large slates. Um, and, you know, a lot of games to get through here. So let's, uh, we went pretty long yesterday. Try and keep it a little bit shorter today, but still, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff to get through. Um, and I talk a lot. Projections and ownership loaded to the site already as usual. Uh, so keep an eye out for updates uh, all throughout the day. We will be pushing them as often as possible whenever anything comes in. Um, we've got some pitcher shenanigans going on so far. Nobody officially announced yet for Toronto. Um, they're at the Trevor Richards point in the rotation. So I've got him in the sheet here. Uh, Boston is going to open uh, Caleb Ort today. Um, Cora said this after the game last night that it's, it's likely to be a, a bullpen game for them here. Um, so I've just got him in the sheet. We don't have an announced like long reliever or anything like that necessarily. And there was one more. Um, I believe, uh, yeah, Austin Cox down here for Kansas City. Um, likely to open him again as well. And he's not going to go all that deep. Um but he might have, you know, three innings or so in him. So we'll see what they want to do. Everybody else, for the most part, looks to be uh, good to go. We might have to keep an eye on what's going on in San Diego. Um, this is our first game here, so let's just get into it. Um, we got to keep an eye on whether it's Snell or whether it's Darvish, right? Darvish got scratched yesterday due to some sort of illness, whatever that means. You know, if it's a cold... Um, Probably pretty unlikely that he'll go today. If it was just like, whatever, you know, bubble guts or something, then, you know, he might be in play. Who knows? So you got to keep an eye out for, you know, what the Padres are going to do. Um, but as of right now, they have an official announced starter as Blake Snell. Um, so we'll just uh, go through things as if it were him. 10-3 on the mound for Snell. Now, he, his last five starts have been fantastic. Um, really getting value out of every single one of the pitches, right? The changeup and the curveball have been excellent all season, right? Really getting value there. Slider's pretty damn good too, right? Getting a lot of whips, of course. The strikeout stuff has, has been, you know, pretty elite all year. We've talked about this every start with Blake Snell. It's, it's the freaking walk problem, man. Um, recently, however... He's been able to get ahead in counts because he's getting more value out of the four-seamer, right? And this is how, even if you've got a ward or two, in particular a walk rate or a barrel rate, this is how you can survive. If you've got good breaking and, and secondary stuff, you have to be able to establish early in the count. And in his last five starts... He's upwards of 65% strike one, right? Well outsized to his seasonal average here. And that's what's led to the elite performances, right? That allows him to throw the good changeup, the good curveball, and the good slider in counts that he wants to throw them in, right? He's not playing from behind. And when he gets ahead in the count, he is deadly. And we've seen that in the last five starts, right? He's got, what, he had 12 strikeouts. Um, in his last start, he had 11 strikeouts against San Francisco, 12 against Tampa in six innings. He struck out 12 at Coors Field, right, against Colorado in seven innings. Struck out another eight against Chicago and seven against Miami, right? And three of those four teams are above av or below average from a starting pitcher standpoint in the strikeout department, right? And he did that at Coors Field and against one of the best offenses in baseball in Tampa, right? And that's what elite strike one numbers can accomplish for you if you've got good breaking stuff. If you do not walk people, now he did walk three against Tampa, but still, that's Tampa. In the start against San Francisco, didn't walk anybody. In the start against Colorado, didn't walk anybody. If you do not walk people, you get ahead early in counts, you can realize your upside. You can go deeper into a game, and here, sure enough, in the last 
five starts, six, six, seven, six, and six innings with whiffs, right? And that's how he can realize upside. In those scenarios, if he doesn't walk anybody, I like he's one of the better arms in baseball for DFS purposes, right? Yeah, sure, he could still get away with a 10% barrel rate if you're not walking people if you, and you're not forcing yourself into bad counts in bad situations where you can't throw your good stuff, right? And you have to kind of scramble with a subpar and below average fastball to get back into account, right? And that elevates pitch count and, and things snowball from there, right? But his swinging strike rate over his last five starts has been north of 60. He's at 18% swing strike rates in a couple of these starts. It's just absolutely elite, what he can do when he throws strikes early in the count. And that puts him in play today against Pirates. Um, I do not like the high ownership, right? And I do not like chasing a lot of really good performances, generally, certainly with starting pitchers. Um, price tag is back above 10000 now, and this is where it should be if he doesn't walk anybody. And I'm fine playing a little bit. I'll probably just come in under because there's some other guys that I'd like to play as well. But I have no problems playing Blake Snell today. Um, as long as he could throw, you know, get ahead in counts and, and throw strike one. That's really fastball command and fastball control is how every single starting pitcher in baseball um, can really take the next step. It drops the walk rate and it allows you to do whatever the hell you want. And if you've got swing and miss, uh, you could blow through anybody, any lineup in baseball. Um and certainly the Pirates would qualify as any lineup in baseball, right? They're just an average team here, 22% K rate, 10% walk rate. So that's a little concerning. Um, and and just because he's had five good starts here and two of which he hasn't walked any, you know, in three of them, he still walked three batters, okay? So the the control problems are not totally, um, totally gone here. So that we still have to keep that in mind with Snell, and that's still what takes me off of a little bit of the high ownership. We got a lot of arms we could play. This is a 13-game slate, and you have five guys or whatever up, up above 10,000 or near 10,000, you know, in Mitch Keller's case on the other side, that you can consider playing. So you don't have to eat this Blake Snell ownership tonight. Um, but I, I have no problem fundamentally if he's going to throw strikes. Now, I, he's still giving up hard contact, right? He's a roughly neutral ground ball to fly ball guy with a little bit of power allowed. But if he's throwing strike one, uh, I don't really care. All of these numbers are going to absolutely tank. Um, and it he becomes very, very equitable. And at 10-3, he may even be underpriced if he can throw strike one. That's really the, the one caveat with him. So I've got no problem going after Pittsburgh here. Um... You know, they had a good night last night because, well, it was Reese Nair on the mound for them. If you want to get to a couple of these guys from the right side, it's Kutch, it's Cabrian Hayes, Henry Davis, uh, Rody Castro hits lefties well, sure. Um, outside of that, not really interested, though. I think Blake Snell is really feeling it right now, and he can be streaky. Uh, so I, I think I'd rather just side with him rather than take shots. But if you want to get leverage with a couple of these guys from the Pirates, that's okay, too. On the other side, I'd, I, Mitch Keller is one of these guys that I'd like to mix into my pools here. It's the ownership that really attracts me here at 5% or so. I mean, the projection's lower. Yeah, we need more out of a guy at this price tag for sure. Um, but fundamentally, right, the Padres are not a very good offense against right-handed pitching, right? All season, just 95 WRC+, plus, 11.5% walk rate coming mostly from Soto, right? 23% K rate. They don't hit for any average. 223 average. This is a terrible figure. One of the lowest numbers on the day. 152 ISO and a 32% hard. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. And they'll create a little bit. This number is only 95 because they walk a little bit. Um, we'll get to another team a little bit later for comparison. He's in a real similar spot. And... It's really just the difference in the walk rate that buoys this WRC+. plus. So it's kind of sneaky high here. They've actually been quite a bit worse against right-handed pitching than that 95 number would suggest. Now, Mitch Keller's been struggling a little bit. 
and I'm not crazy about the price tag necessarily. The Padres' offense has been better of late. With a couple of guys like Hassan Kim really heating up, Juan Soto, of course. Manny Machado's been good recently, too. Uh, but I think the ownership here really puts him in play to pivot off of, like, if you're giving me five, five and a half to one on Mitch Keller to outperform or, or perform as well as Blake Snell tonight, I think that's probably a number we got to take. And that's what we're getting here in the ownership figure. Um, now, yes, there's a three, nearly four point projection delta, and that matters, of course. And Mitch Keller has been struggling, right? Um, so consistency wise, trend wise, you'd rather just go to Blake Snell, of course, if we could make the 400 extra happen. But Mitch Keller certainly you know, is not a bad arm or anything like that. And over the, his last couple of starts, perhaps starting to figure it out again, um, you know, the strikeout stuff has really always been there, you know, the whole year. Really to both sides of the plate. He's just pitched to a little bit more contact over his last several starts. Got beat up against Oakland. Didn't have anything there. And the product or the production suppression, I should say, uh, has really been what's eating him alive over his last several starts. However, two of his last three uh, against Miami and the Mets, he only gave up one run and the strikeout stuff was there. Spraying the hits a little bit in you know when he started downtrending. You know, gave up seven against Seattle, seven hits, that is, in six runs, 10 hits against San Francisco, and then eight hits against Oakland, et cetera, et cetera. But he's dialed that in over his last three starts. So I think he's starting to trend back upward a little. Now, I do not like the price tag, and the price tag is up at the top of the price range for him. So we got to keep that in mind. Um, but I think this is a fine tournament spot to get to a little bit of Mitch Keller. And you don't need a ton here. You don't need to really expose yourself to a super high price tag. Uh, because he's only 5% owned here. So I, I'm really attracted to the full six-pitch six mix. Needs to work on the changeup, of course, and get a little bit more value out of that, and a curveball too. But break-even, you know, secondary stuff is is reasonable when you've got very, very good fastball mix here that you're super balanced with. Uh, in the four-seamer, two-seamer, and the cutter. So I'm okay playing a little bit of Mitch Keller here, mostly just pitching in this uh, in this game for me. Not overly attracted to offense outside of like a Soto, 5,500. He's well-priced, uh, or maybe a piece here or there where on the other side, getting some leverage against Blake Snell where they are well-priced. Okay, Cincinnati and Baltimore. I think we can get to both offenses here in this game. Because Luke Weaver is definitely not in play. Um, not for me, at least. 6,400 for him. I don't like the price tag, really. I think he'd need to be 5400 because his numbers this season are terrible. Now, we're probably looking for a little bit of positive regression for him. He's got a 685 ERA with a 465 XFIP. Um, you know, big whip here. It's mostly because he's pitching to way too much contact. He throws a lot of strikes. He just doesn't have any chase, so he can't induce a lot of swing and miss. And we see that translate 15% or a K rate to the left side and 22% K rate to the right side in the platoon advantage. Giving up way too much hard contact, and it's barrel contact. Full 11.5% here. In aggregate, 31% hard to the lefties, 44% hard to the righties. So he's really getting picked apart to, by same-handed hitters here. 329 average allowed, 411 Woba. Again, not because of walks, just 4.5% walk rate. 282 ISO. Now, as I mentioned, maybe looking for a little bit of positive regression. Got a very low strand rate here. And an XFIP, two runs lower than his realized ERA. But he's not going to throw a pass people, which is a 19% aggregate K rate and 9% swinging strike rate. CSW is you know, it's fine at 26%. Um, but given these figures, either the CSW should be worse or the figures should be better, right? So... The expected bat at ball metric suggesting that he's probably running a little bit cold, certainly at, at a 217 X ISO. You know, the numbers to both sides of the plate are far higher than that. Same thing with the Woba, 357 X Woba. Both num numbers to both sides of the plate far higher than that. And similarly in the expected batting average as well. So probably looking for a little bit of positive regression for Weaver. But that doesn't mean that a 217 XB or a X ISO is a good number. right? That's still very much tackable. And hard contact, you can't really fake this. right? At 38.5% hard contact, um, maybe the results will change a little bit. 
but the hard contact number won't necessarily. If you can't stay off of the barrel, you're going to get pieced apart. And I want to play Baltimore. I think they're one of the top stacks of the day. They're very well priced here. Cedric at 47, I like this a good bit. Rutch at 51, I like this too. Anthony Santander, of course, he's still at 4,400. He's still a really good play. Ryan O'Hearn, 3,200, dual eligibility at first in the outfield. You could play him. I would like to get to a couple of the righties. We'll, we're not sure they are starting to play the platoon game a good bit over here in Baltimore also. Um, Gunner should be back in. He's well-priced at 4,600. That's fine. Georgie Mateo and Jordan Westberg might be a couple of Austin Hayes. Sure. Might be the only righties in the lineup. We'll see. Um, but I'm fine getting to Baltimore. It's not like he's not giving it up to lefties. Luke Weaver either, you know, 233 realized ISO here with a 15% strikeout rate, very much attackable, a lot of fly balls and hard contact. So we want to go after that and it should be warm in Baltimore. Kyle Gibson on the mound for the O's, and I don't want to play him necessarily. Um, you now, he does have six pitches, and he's hard to really figure out. I mentioned this every start with Kyle Gibson. Hard to peg because you all of his pitches are break-even. Um, he doesn't get really – I mean, he, the average of all of this is zero, exactly. right? So he, he is a stone break-even arm um, that doesn't throw it past anybody. So he's not all that impressive. And he's not all that exciting to play on the mound. At 7,900, I think he's probably overpriced in this particular matchup. I think the Reds are in play. The Reds, unfortunately, are still just expensive, right? These numbers are going to tick up, of course. We've talked about this. 252 average is is pretty respectable. 10% walk rate, that's going to definitely go up with Joey Votto back. 153 ISO, not all that impressive, but it's going to continue to tick up if Votto is platooned and Ellie starts hitting for a lot more power again against right-handers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're expensive, though. Matt McLean, I think, is probably my favorite from the right side at 4,400. He's pretty well-priced there. TJ Friedel at 43, that's fine, too. Um, Jake Fraley at 47, a little stiff, but uh, all the power in the world against right-handers. Elliott, 55, a little bit better price tag, more palatable today. Votto still at 52. Steer at 46 is an all-right price, but... Um, you know, they're, they're not cheap here, and that would kind of take them, you know, put shove them down the board and down the list a little bit for me. Uh, but I think they're very much in play going after Kyle Gibson. I don't really trust the guy. Uh, and if he's on the downside of the variance in anywhere here, um, especially, you know, in aggregate, as I mentioned, the, the value here is zero exactly. So, um, you know, he could really get picked apart and give up a crooked number. Now, in his last, his last start, he did get... Um, pretty pieced and we don't want to be dealing with that for the most part um you know chasing back-to-back -back good or bad outings necessarily with a starting pitcher so that might suggest that he could survive here just looking for a bounce right he gave up five earned on seven hits against seattle um and i think that you know that may have been a rain out or something like that i don't know in any case, five earned in three innings is not good. So Kyle Gibson, uh, not all that thrilling to be playing at this particular price tag. 6900 would make him more interesting, I think, um, and taking some shorts on the expensive Reds prices over here. But for the most part, no pitching in this game for me and just offense, I think. Baltimore really attractive there. All right, San Francisco and Toronto. Logan Webb here, 10-6. It's kind of a gross price tag in this matchup, but it, once again, similar to Mitch Keller, it's the ownership that's going to put him in play. He's one of the few guys that has a pretty consistent, you know, 20 point, or I don't want to call it a floor for a starting pitcher necessarily, but um, because of the ground, high ground ball stuff here and the decent whiffs that he can induce, staying down in the strike zone in particular with the change up to lefties and slider to right handers. Uh, yeah, this makes him very serviceable. It doesn't really have a floor necessarily, but he's pretty consistent for the most part. He'll throw out a stinker every now and then when he's floating the sinker um, and, and really not inducing any whiffs with the slider. And that, that'll get him picked apart a couple of times. But he doesn't walk people. He's not going to beat himself. It's just that if he doesn't have it, and every starting pitcher goes through that. So I'm okay playing Logan Webb, even in a very difficult matchup here. We saw what... Alex Wood did to them yesterday. Now, the Toronto is far better against righties than they are against lefties, right? 21% K rate here, 111 WRC+. Plus. Hit for more power, more average, and more hard contact against right-handers. 
uh, despite being very right-handed heavy themselves. However, they're pretty expensive here, and this is a down matchup because Logan Webb is one of the better arms in baseball. Um, I wouldn't put him in the top five category, perhaps not even the top 10, but he's certainly top 15 because of the ground, a high ground ball rate to both sides and the whiffs that he can induce. Doesn't give up a lot of production, doesn't give up a lot of power. So um, the one weakness here, if you want to call it a weakness, 255 average allowed that's a little elevated with a 151 ISO to the righties. But he doesn't give up any hard contact here. Soft contact is yeah, fine. It's 17% to the right side. And 2.7 ground balls per fly ball. He's off of the line. So it's going to be difficult for Toronto to really lift the baseball and hit for a good bit of average and a good bit of power because so many of Logan Webb's outs either come via the whiff or the weak ground ball. So I'm okay playing him in a down matchup. You'll probably be hard-pressed to see a lot of strikeout stuff from him here. Um, because they do make a lot of contact still. But for the most part, I think he's uh, very much in play at 10-6, an elevated price tag for the matchup. It's going to keep his ownership way down, and I think that puts him in play. He still has a solid 22 to 25 points in the arsenal here, and I think that's fine generally uh, for somebody right around 10-K in a bad matchup. Uh, Trevor Richards on the other side. I want to play the Giants. If it is Trevor Richards, um, I want to I want to go after this, right? He is only a two pitch guy, and oop, we got a little pop up here. Um, sorry, trying to uh, control things here. Okay, um, he's only a two pitch guy, right? Trevor Richards. He's got the four seamer. He's got the change. Now he's getting good change of value. Um, However, a lot of his appearances this season have come out of the bullpen. He's had a couple of starts, right? Um, and is really you know stretched out okay enough, right? His last couple outings have been, um, you know, as a, a legit starter, right? And he really has gone what three innings? I think is is the deepest his um, his production is has really uh, offered the Blue Jays here. So he's probably going to be pretty short for this. So this may turn into a bullpen game, uh, which could take you off of a little bit of the Giants. They're a high variance, um, high variance offense, right? A lot of walks, a lot of strikeouts, a lot of power. So that could take you off of them a little bit, but uh, I think this is very much attackable if it is going to be Trevor Richards that you see for perhaps a full three innings or so is stretched out enough for that. Even those last two outings, um, you know, he, the last time he threw was what f a full five days ago. And I believe he was the opener went in inning and two thirds there. Um, so they should be stretching him out a little bit more, probably has three innings, perhaps even four if he's running well and getting some swing and miss like, a lot of swing and miss here for sure, and that's because of the good change of value. But he's walking some guys, and he's on the barrel, and he's only got the two pitches. So I want to go after that. I think the Giants are an intriguing stack here, um, attacking this and going after the Blue Jays' uh, bullpen game here. Um, now, where they're well-priced, I think they're certainly playable. Conforto, Blake Sable, Patty Bailey in particular from the left side. Lamont Wade for sure at 4,100. I think that's fine. Jock? You, know, you could play against most every righty in baseball. He's 4,900, though, so a little stiff there. Um, and you can certainly play Tyro. He's got enough pop against a just a two-pitch guy um, in Trevor Richards over here. So we'll see what they want to do. We'll have to keep an eye on it throughout the day. Um, but I think the Giants are an intriguing you know, possible short stack, maybe. Uh, or even full stack. Yeah, I think it's um, an intriguing tournament stack. Okay, let's move on now that I am... Uh, less distracted with all the pop-ups going on here. Um, Milwaukee and the Mets. Um, Wade Miley on the mound here. Now, I don't play Wade Miley. I, I don't necessarily think he's in play. His 15% K rate, right? 55% strike one, no chase anymore, 7% swing strike rate. This is not impressive. In his last outing, however, and in his last two outings, number one, the velocity's been up a couple of ticks, right? So he's been sitting 91-92, in his last couple starts, coming off the, the lat strain, I believe it was. Uh, secondly, in his last outing, he threw a sinker. 
a little bit, and he so he introduced a, a new pitch that he hadn't really been well. Um, I, I don't want to call it a new pitch. He mostly threw a sinker earlier in his career, but at least recently has moved a lot of that over to the cutter. That's allowed him to survive and suppress contact um, in the you know the later years here. He brought it back in the last start. And he, he really liked the movement he got on the pitch. So um, that could put him a little bit more in play with a full six-pitch arsenal here. Not necessarily at the price tag at 6900 in this matchup against the Mets, who aren't going to strike out a lot. But that could put survivability uh, on the table here for Wade Miley. And since the Mets offense overall is pretty bad... Right, just break you. I know they put up seven runs yesterday. Most of that came from Nimmo and Lindor, right? They don't do this a hell of a lot, um, or all that regularly. You know, against left-handed pitching, against right-handed pitching, pretty much at all, right? They are a break-even offense that just doesn't strike out. They're similar with a little bit more upside to Cleveland and Washington, right? They don't strike out a lot, but they hit a lot of ground balls. Don't hit for a whole lot of power, and it's just medium and you know, kind of average contact here. So not overly impressive, not a lot of batting average or on base percentage, right? So they're a, a pretty difficult offense to get thrilled with stacking. Um, even though Wade Miley does give give up a good bit of hard contact to the right side, 37% here, and some fly balls, that's attackable. Uh, if he is throwing the two-seamer to the righties, you know, that's not good. Um but he can, with this good cutter value, keep right-handers off the board a little bit. So that would kind of take me off of, you know, some of these right-handers from the Mets, in particular, like Starling Marte, Frankie Lindor, Pete Alonso, Tommy Pham, Frankie Alvarez, right? That's a, a fine and, and attractive price-wise little stack here. Frankie's at 54. Pete Alonso, 5,000. You can always play him. Marte, 39. Again, not a lot of power upside from him. You're going to need him to get on and steal bases, Tommy Pham's been decent recently. He's fine in the middle of the lineup, 32. So is Frankie Alvarez. He's going to swing out of his shoes every time. That's fine if you want to go after that. But a six-pitch arsenal against a bad offense is actually pretty respectable here. I don't really want to play him, but that does kind of take me off of the Mets here a little bit. So um, I'm just kind of meh on the Mets here. Uh, I do like the price tag on Pete Alonso. I will have some of him for sure, and probably a little bit of Tommy Pham and, and certainly some Frankie Lindor. I think that's a really good price. But full stacks I'm not super attracted to if Wade Miley's going to be introducing a, a new pitch here. And that th that really actually would give him a full you know five pitch and, and pretty equitable five pitches here. Uh, so I... I think that's fine, you know, neutral and, and negative value on a slide or whatever. But um, I think that's fine coming off of a little bit of the Mets. Still going to be pretty hard-pressed for Wade Miley on a 13-game slate to get you there, unless he goes pretty deep. Could I say on the mound for the Mets? 10-1. Now, it, he's in play, right? And this is the the matchup I was uh, alluding to earlier uh, with the Milwaukee Brewers. Very similar against righties. Um to the Padres, right? They've got basically equal numbers. Now, the Brewers are going to strike out about tick, tick and a half more, and the Padres is going to walk about two ticks more. But everything else is virtually equal, and the only difference here in the 95 WRC Plus that the Padres have versus the 87 that the Brewers have against right-handers is the walk rate. All right, they strike out a little bit more, make a little bit less contact, but the averages are similar. Every other number is basically the exact same. So that has to put Kodai Senga in play. The problem here and the difference here is that Kodai Senga has a 13.5% walk rate still. In his last outing, once again, walked three batters. He's very similar to Blake Snell and all these guys with major walk problems. They elevate their own pitch count. If they cannot establish early in the count and get to their equitable secondary offerings... Uh, then they're going to have a lot of trouble running deep into games. Because of the matchup, Kodai Senga has to be in play. But because of the ownership, I'm going to come off of this, I think, and I'd rather just pivot it to Mitch Keller. I think the matchups are, are the same. And Mitch Keller, does, he has half of the walk rate, less than half. He's got about 35 or 40% of the walk rate that Kodai Senga has. He just has more upside to run deeper into a game. The strikeout stuff for those two guys is similar 
we talked about the walk rate. The batted ball profile is pretty similar. Mitch Keller actually gives up you know, way less hard contact. He's got the best aggregate hard contact number allowed on the slate today. Kodai Senga certainly does not. So I would much rather play Mitch Keller, I think, against the Padres in what seems like a more difficult matchup, but he's a quarter of the ownership, and I don't have to deal with this high-variance walk rate that Kodai Senga exhibits literally every damn start. So um, I'm probably going to stay off of this, and at this high ownership figure, I would like to play him when he's not uh, not very popular, right? And I'd certainly be more attracted to him if there weren't, you know, four other guys above 10,000 that I'm okay playing. So uh, for the most part, that takes me off of the Brewers. Um, if you want to full stack them and attack a high walk variance, that's okay because they are better against right-handers than they are against lefties. But once again, this is a, not a very good offense. Uh, so it, it puts Senga in play. I'd probably just have to side with them if I had to choose, but I'm off of uh, pretty much everybody here for the most part outside of a couple of well-priced Mets pieces. Um, or maybe a, like a super shrewd, deep, deep tournament, you know, 150 max Wade Miley type of play. Uh, okay, let's move on. Braxton Garrett on the mound for the Marlins. He's been fantastic over his last several starts, too. I think he's a terrible matchup, but however, he's still got some warts. Um, I think he's running a little bit hot recently. Um, he's one of their younger arms, and what they do with, with Garrett here. They they don't really like letting him go a third time through the lineup. He's got horrible historical numbers um, third time through the lineup, and he gives up a lot of power the first and second time to the through the lineup to the right side in particular. Right, 261 average allowed. It's not a horrific number, but it's elevated. 315 woba. That's fine. 173 ISO, though, is high and a 45% hard contact nearly. Now, he does get ground balls. That's attractive. 1.9 in aggregate, 175 to the righties. That's very strong, and you can get away with more hard contact, as I mentioned all the time, if you're getting ground balls. But it's still worrisome. Anything north of 40% hard contact, like half of the, the balls that you give up here are... Technically, 95, give or take, miles an hour uh, it, off the bat or, or more. I mean, as we can see it here, 91 mile an hour average exit velo. That's a high number. Um, so it makes it difficult to stack against because he does still have whiffs, right? And he doesn't walk anybody. So it's mostly short pieces of the Boston Red Sox I'm, I'd am i be attracted to. Like a Rob Ref Snyder hits lefties very well. You can always play Devers. Adam Duvall, 4,600, attractive price tag there. 43 for Justin Turner at sole first base, not the greatest. But he doesn't strike out a, a lot. Um, and he's been pretty okay over the last couple of weeks. So I think that's a fine little short stack if you want to consider that. Uh, Yoshida probably back in the lineup. Unfortunately, he's 4,800 in the downside of a platoon. From the left side of the plate, um, probably, and he might be in the six hole. Not super attractive there. Um, you know, some cheaper Connor Wong, Christian Arroyo types of pieces down at the bottom of the lineup if you do get to full Boston tax. This is at Fenway, and it is warm there. And Braxy Garrett does give up uh, power, right? He probably only long for about six innings here, unless he's really cruising. And I think that's mostly pretty unlikely high walk rate low strikeout rate for the Red Sox here they against lefties they hit for a lot of average 262 with a 113 WRC plus not so much power necessarily and some ground balls so that kind of takes me off of full stacks um in general but I, I do like some pieces that hit lefties well like a ref Snyder Adam Duvall types in particular um Caleb Ward on the mound I did I Maybe I mentioned him at the top. I forget. Um, he is just going to open, so we can't play him. No idea what they're going to do. It's probably just going to be a bullpen game here for Miami. But I think they're once again in play, and they could have won tournaments for you last night. Uh, they really jumped on Garrett Whitlock, um, which has ch like he changes this the whole complexion of this entire lineup here. With him back in there against any righty in baseball, uh, you can play him. At 5,100, he's a very playable piece. He's got speed, too, as long as he's got the turf toe under control. He'll he'll be stealing some bases for you. Um, I'm most attracted here to actually a Jorge Soler, 4,600. This is a fantastic price tag for him, even against a right-hander. We usually only want him... I mean, we more so want him against lefties, of course, but 
Uh, 4,600 at Fenway it is very playable, and this is probably going to be a bullpen arm. So I think Miami is once again in play. You can always play Luis Arise uh, because he makes so much contact. You know, you really only need 15, 18 points at him, and that's very much in range for him if he gets on base four times every night. So you could play a uh, some of these cheaper guys, like a Jesus Sanchez at 3,100. That's fine. Brian De La Cruz is fine as well. So I think the Marlins are once again in play going after what's a likely bullpen game here for the Red Sox. Um, so I'm kind of off of pitching a little bit of Braxton Garrett. I mean, sure, if you want to mix him in in tournaments, I think it's okay. Um, I'm not super jacked about the price tag. It's kind of elevated now that he's had, you know, what, three or four good starts in a row. And this is a tough matchup against a pretty low strikeout team against left-handed pitching. And I'm concerned about depth for him mostly. Um and, and strikeout upside. So kind of meh on, on the pitching here and mostly just offense, I think. Okay, let's move on to Houston and St. Louis. I'm off of pitching here in this game too. Christian Javier, I think he's too expensive because the strikeout stuff is totally gone. Like, where is it? He's very similar to like a Sonny Gray, right, in terms of the strikeout split. Uh, sick, very low strikeout stuff against the left side. It's because he doesn't have a changeup or a whiff pitch there. 16% is, is kind of out of control. 31%, though, to the right side. So if we're going to target guys, it's going to be, well, number one, they're lefties, right? Or low strikeout guys from the right side. Well, good news for the Cardinals. Uh, They've got all kinds of these guys. Uh, Brendan Donovan doesn't strike out a lot. Probably going to lead him off from the left side, right? Javier gives up a 183 ISO to the lefties so far this year. He's got a 210 X ISO. He's probably running a little bit hot, to be honest. 24% 24% hard with a 21% soft against lefties is concerning with so many fly balls. So it's not my favorite getting to low upside guys generally like a Brendan Donovan or a Tommy Edmond from the left side of the plate. But Lars is fine. He's got a little bit of pop at 4,200. Probably have him, you know, either leading off or somewhere near the top of the lineup in the platoon advantage here. But from the right side, you've got Goldschmidt down to 56 and Nolan Arenado at 53, both lower strikeout bats. And historically, Christian Javier has actually given up way more hard contact, 38% that's persisting still this season, to the right side instead of the lefties. So heavy, heavy fly ball pitcher generally makes it difficult to stack against them. But a 10% barrel rate is still very attackable, 55% strike one. He's elevating his pitch count too and not able to go deep into games because he can't get ahead of hitters. He's only got effectively two pitches here. Now they're equitable for him. But he still gives up pop, and he's still got some warts. And with such a low strikeout rate against the lefties, I mean, Cardinals probably going to have four lefties at least in the lineup tonight. So I would like to get to a little bit of Nolan Gorman here um, and and some Lars. Lars in particular I, I'm pretty attracted to, not necessarily because of price, batted ball matchup-wise, though. I think it's pretty intriguing. Should be able to get to baseball on the line here a little bit against Javier. Uh, and these right-handers, Arenado and Goldschmidt, you can play Wilson Contreras too. I think he's a really intriguing stack for the Cardinals um, targeting Javier, so I'm not really interested there. Miles Michaelis on the mound for the Birds. I, I don't want to deal with this either. I think he's overpriced. I don't think he's very good. Um, he doesn't have any swing and miss stuff. He doesn't have ground balls anymore. And, like, all of the ground balls, he used to have, you know, 2-0 ground ball to fly ball ratio or whatever. He's moved all of that over to line drives. He has a 27% line drive rate. This is out of control high. So I, do, I don't want to go anywhere near this. I think he's overpriced. And this is a difficult matchup uh, against Houston, just average, slightly above average for an offense. 22% K rate here, average walk rate, 97 WRC+. plus. Now missing Jordan Alvarez is really killing their upside uh, against right-handers in particular. So Michaelis might be able to actually survive and run deep into a game if they are just cold and they can't produce anything, but they're not, he's not going to strike anybody out, right? He has a 16% strikeout rate and the guys at the top of the lineup, Jose Altuve, he should be back tonight. Just got a day off yesterday. Alex Bregman, Kyle Tucker, they don't strike out. Uh, Mo Dubone, we'll see what they want to do with him. These guys don't strike out. Some guys down at the bottom of the lineup, um, you know, the younger outfielders, Corey Jolks, Chaz will whiff a little bit. Um, you know, they, they still are perfectly capable hit tools, even though they do have some whiffs in them. Jeremy Pena, sure. I, so I'm not overly interested in Miles Michaelis. I think he's a really shrewd spot to get to some Houston. Um, 
you know, they're not going to be all that popular because there's plenty of other offenses that you can get to. We'll get to Coors Field in Texas here in a little while. Um, but I, I like Houston a good bit going after Michael is he pitches to 86% contact. Are you kidding me? He throws so many strikes that like he's similar to a, um, a George Kirby. He just does not walk people and he throws it right over the damn plate. Um, now Kirby's a hell of a lot more efficient. Of course, Michael is not so much line drive rate at 27%. This is mega attackable. I want to go after this. So give me Houston. They're very well priced. They got price drops today. Give me Kyle Tucker for sure. Yiner Diaz. Once again, I think this is fine. Whoever they play in the outfield, Chaz or Corey Jolks also fine. Jeremy Pena at 41. I'm okay with this. And both Bregman and Jose Altuve at the top of the lineup are fine too. So give me the Astros and a little bit of sneaky Cardinal stacks too. Uh, I think everybody offensively is really in play. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Texas. Um, Joey Wentz, no thank you. We can get through this pretty quickly. He's got 14 starts this year and 15 appearances. 60% strike one's fine, but a 10% walk rate struggles with the control a little bit. Just 25% chase. Now, he does have a 10% swing strike rate and a 26% CSW. This like There are worse numbers out there. 675 ERA with a 485 XFIP, probably looking for a little bit of suppression regression coming to Joey Wentz. However, buck 60 whip buoyed by that walk rate and an 11% barrel rate are not attractive. So I'm not going anywhere near this. I'm not looking for this regression to start to uh, creep to the surface against Texas. Um, Texas against left-handers this season, 134 WRC plus. You kidding me? 10% walk rate, 21% K rate, 294 batting average against left-handers, 38% hard contact with a 180 ISO nearly, 363 WOBA. Like, this this team is elite, and I want to stack Texas. They're number two on the day, and only number two because you get the Dodgers at Coors Field once again. So, um, certainly a top stack, and if you can make this happen, they're not going to be nearly as popular as the Dodgers. Dodgers probably actually going to see more ownership today than they did yesterday, which is kind of crazy. Um, but did, like everybody from the from the Rangers, top to bottom, doesn't matter who they play, they're all excellent against left-handed pitching. And I think it's a really, really bad spot for Joey Wentz. So no thank you there, and give me all of Texas. Um, maybe pretty much everybody. You, I think my favorite from from the offense. I mean, it's hard to really choose to be honest. My favorite is always Corey Seager, righty or lefty. Um, but Garcia in the outfield at 54, I think is, is probably got to be the favorite, but literally all of them. I, I do like Zeke Duran as well. Dane Dunning on the mound for the Rangers. Um, this has to put him in play 6,100. Now I, he just does not throw it past anybody. It's super difficult for him to realize a floor unless he runs deep into a game. Now, recently he has been doing that, right? He's got seven innings in his last outing against the Yankees, six against Toronto, um, He's, he's popped for a couple of six-inning starts, and he's gone five or more in every one of his last, or each of his last two, four, six, eight, uh, what, ten starts? Nine starts? Um, so we're not super concerned with depth because he does have that in him, and that's mostly because of a very equitable fastball mix here. Two-seamer against righties, cutter against lefties that keep, uh, that really uh, sort of, you know, keep everybody off the board for sure. Um, and really neutralize the lack of strikeout stuff here, inducing a lot of soft contact and weak contact to left-handers with this cutter. It's a fantastic pitch. Slider's been pretty damn good too. Now the changeup, he's leaving it on the table there. He could get a little bit more whiff out of the left-handers um, if he improved the value there. But for the most part, a three-pitch mix in the, in the two-seamer cutter slider is pretty okay. Um, but overall, pretty unimpressive and underwhelming, certainly in the strikeout department. 8% swinging strike rate, a lot of contact here, 83%. This is Detroit. It's the second time he's seeing them this season. He went five innings, uh, struck out six, sprayed seven hits, gave up three runs in, the, in his previous outing. So that's the problem here. If he gives up any production whatsoever, it's super hard for him to get that back because of the lack of a floor in strikeouts. But he's very efficient, stays off of the barrel, and he doesn't walk anybody. So that puts him in play at 6,100 against a pretty poor offense against right-handers. They're much better against lefties, Detroit, than they are against righties. 83 WRC plus 24% K rate, 32% hard, that's average, 126 ISO, well below average. 
So not overly impressive here. 228 batting average here. Uh, one of the lower numbers on the day for sure. So that puts Dane Dunning in play if you need it at 6,100. Um, 14, 15% ownership. I think this is fine if you're building a ton of teams here. I don't really want to get leverage on him because it's difficult for him to to really wow us. I think his ceiling is probably capped at like 20, 22 points, somewhere around there. That's usually fine for somebody in this range. But overall, uh, pretty unimpressive. Nice value score, but um, you know, questions in, in upside for sure. I think that puts a, a couple of these well-priced Tigers in play, in particular Kerry Carpenter, 3,600, but really hard to get enthused with left-handers going after this cutter here. It's a really damn good pitch um, from Dane Dunning. So eh, mostly just kind of off of the Tigers. They've got Zach McKinstry, but he's 4,200. I'm not jacked about that. Rather play some other outfielders, I think. And everybody else is either right-handed or bad. So, no thank you. Um, so, that has to put Dane Dunning in, in play to a certain degree. But give me all the Texas. Uh, okay, let's move on. Philly and the Cubs. I want to go back to, back to Philly, even though they got torn apart by freaking Jamison Tyon last night somehow. Uh, I don't know. Kyle Schwarber is just dreadful. Um 10-4 on the mound for NOLA for the Phillies. Now, I don't really want to do this. Like... I don't think Nola is all that great anymore, to be quite honest. Um, now, I know that he'll pop here or there, right? He had 12 Ks against Detroit, but that's Detroit. Let's not get carried away. Every other outing this season, like some of the strikeout, like it's way up and down, right? Struck out five against the Mets, five in his last outing against Atlanta. He struck out nine against Arizona, but he gave up four runs, right? Struck out seven against the Dodgers in six and a third, but he gave up six runs. Right, struck out five in that Mets start, but gave up four. Right, struck out seven against Atlanta in his previous start before that, gave up five runs. You know what I mean? Like he could strike out ten against the Cubs. He did that earlier this season. That's great. Only gave up two, and that was one of the few outings where he popped. But he was ninety two hundred there. You now got to pay twelve hundred more for him, and he got to eat twenty percent ownership. He's one of these guys. I'm probably just going to come in under on, similar to Kodai Senga. Um, up above 10,000. I'd rather play the other guys, I think. Um, you know, we haven't gotten to Eflin yet. He, I'll probably leave him off too. But, I mean, this is a fine matchup. I don't have a problem necessarily going after the Cubs with historically high upside right-handers. And once again, like, he did strike out 10 in seven innings against them earlier in the season. But this is the second time they're going to see him. I generally see, side with the offense in that scenario. Um so at this particular price tag, I'm probably just going to come off. Like, he's got a break-even curveball for all intents and purposes, dead break-even change, and a break-even four-seamer that he's throwing the most. Two-seamer has been good, but Cutter, he's giving back a lot of the value that he gets on the four-seamer right back with the Cutter. So, I mean, look at these power numbers, 177 ISO to both sides allowed. That's not really all that attractive. That's an attackable figure. He does have a 166 X ISO with a 440 ERA and an, an XFIP slightly lower than that, right? The XERA about a run lower than that, 64% strand rate. The control has never been a problem, right? It's 64% strike one, doesn't walk anybody, still has chase, still has some swing strikes with a 30% CSW. But overall, he's just pitching to a bit too much contact deeper in the count. And 25% Ks to right-handers, that's nice, but just average strikeouts to the lefties with some walks so overall not all that impressive to be quite honest I think he's probably a bit overpriced for my liking he's similar to Luis Castillo for me in that when we get above 10,000 for him it's just like takes him out of play for me there's way too much variance I think for Nola um, and really he's had three serviceable outings this season four if you want to count his start against Toronto where he went six struck out six gave up two runs um, that was 20 DK points. He's had a 40-point game against Detroit, 33-point game against these Cubs, and a 30-point game against Houston. Everything else has been below 15. So, I mean, there's a lot of variance here with Nolan. It makes him a fine tournament play, but not at high ownership against an okay offense. I mean, it's not a great team by any stretch, but they did just get Cody Bellinger back from the left side. He's at a playable 4,500 here. Mike Talkman, they've been leading off. He's been turning the lineup over for him at the top. He's still very cheap, 2,600. I think he's a fine play today. Ian Happ, you know, got into a couple of balls in London. Um, 4,100, he's fine from the left side too. You want to play a couple of these other righties, Nico, Seiya, Dansby, they're all fine. 
I don't really want to go after Nola necessarily, but I don't really want to play him um, necessarily either. So, meh. Uh, Drew Smiley, I don't really want to play him. I want to play the Phillies once again, but unfortunately, they still play Kyle Schwarber for some freaking reason. I want him to be better, so I'm going to try and tilt him as much as I can right now uh, because he's just been absolute garbage all season. Um, and this isn't even because I played him last night. He's just awful. Uh, he strikes out way too much. The plate discipline really isn't all that great. And he can't make any damn contact. So he leading him off, um, the, like, they got to do something else. Yeah, this this kind of batted ball profile with a Schwarber, they have to put him in, like, the 6 or the 7 hole, hole or something. It's, it's just been terrible. So, unfortunately, Trey Turner, Nick Castellanos, Bryce Harper, JTR can't hit with runners on base because Kyle Schwarber can't get on. Um, so he is not a leadoff hitter. I don't care how much you walk. Like, you have to be able to make contact, too, and strike out far far less than he does so that makes it hard for him to or for me to play him certainly in the downside of a platoon matchup here um even though drew smiley does give up a little bit of power to the left side i'm yeah kind of lukewarm on on, on shore i'll probably have some you know just because i like the phillies in general here with trey turner castellanos 43 i like this harper i'm fine playing you know much more in a in the downside of the platoon than than schwarber and I really like Alec Baum against left-handers, pretty much every lefty in baseball. JTR's fine, too. He just got a day off yesterday. Should be back. Um, so I like the Phillies a little bit here at Mendoza down at the bottom. He'll make it cheap at 2,300. That's a fine third-base play, I think. Going after Drew Smiley, he still throws just a two-seamer. right? I'm not intrigued with this price tag here. I think it's just kind of meh. I don't think there's a lot of value we could squeeze out of this necessarily in this particular matchup, even though the Phillies do strike out against left-handers and are for the most part, bad. Uh, 91 WRC plus, 26% K rate. Hit for a little bit of average, about average. It, but even with Schwarber's walk rate in aggregate, they don't walk a lot, just 6% here. 180 ISO, average pretty much everywhere. I do want to get to them because I want to short Drew Smiley because he's only got the one good pitch, um, and that's really the curveball, but he's got the one bad fastball in the two-seamer. So give me some righties here. Probably just short Nick Castellanos, uh, Alec Bohm, Throw in JTR, you know, throw in Turner and Harper if you want to get to full stacks. I think that's fine. But no Drew Smiley and probably no Aaron Nola here for me. I think just offense for the most part. Okay, let's move on. Cleveland and Kansas City. Um, Logan Allen on the mound. I think this is fine. 8,000. I think he's in play in tournaments, certainly at 8%. Uh, Kansas City is just terrible. And we talked about this yesterday. Like, hard for these offenses to do anything. Um, they're just bad, and if you've got a respectable arm on the other side, they just cannot produce. They are horrific top to bottom. Now, the Royals, they do make a lot more hard contact against lefties than they do against righties. 89 WRC+. plus, Still just as bad because they don't create. The only guy that steals bases is Bobby Witt, but he has to be able to get on base first. Um, he's been struggling with that recently for sure. They can platoon. Salvi should be back tonight behind the plate. Just got a day off, I believe. Mikel Garcia, they'll probably have him up at the top. Fine third base price play at 3100 if you get there. Eddie Olivares always pops in value. He's in the middle of the lineup in the outfield, 2700 today. Matt Duffy always pops in value as well, but he stinks. Dual eligibility, first and second base, 2100 That's why he pops so hard. Um, you know, some of the outfielders, Samad Taylor, Drew Waters, whatever. Darren Blanco, you can play in full stacks of the Royals, but I'm not super thrilled about going after them. Really, the only two guys I'd really want to play are Bobby Witt and Salvi Perez, maybe an Eddie Olivares or Mikel Garcia, but Witt and, and Salvi are 48 and 4,700. And do I really want to pay those price tags going after Logan Allen? Eh, probably not. I really respect him. Now, he does give up some average. 286 to the right-handers with a 334 Woba, not because of walks. It's mostly contact. 150 ISO, it's not a bad number. But it's not uh, not an elite figure either, right? 22% strikeout rate. It's depressed in the platoon, despite having a three-pitch mix that he goes to work with. A little bit of a cutter. Wish you'd you know, figure out the velocity delta here between the slider. He needs to throw the slider a little bit harder, I think. Get this up to about 82, 84, somewhere around there. And that should narrow the gap, the value gap, at least, of the cutter. In any case, he's not super attackable because he does still have four pitches, uh, break-even, fastball, giving up some value on the cutter for sure, and a little bit on the slider, but the changeup is okay, and for the most part, that's what neutralizes some of the power to the righties. So um, these right-handers, not 
super thrilling, to be quite honest. Bobby Witt is in play, of course, against pretty much every lefty because he can't steal bases. Salvi always in play, sure. Um, but overall, I think I'd have to side with Logan Allen once again here, even though he is a lefty getting the Royals, who make some hard contact. On the other side, it is going to be probably Austin Cox here. We'll have to keep an eye out for what they do. Um, you know, they, they just screw around in the rotation. They don't really know what they're doing. We're kind of at that point in the season where teams are just, like, throwing whoever they got that, uh, you know, that didn't throw the day before, right? Now, Austin Cox here, coming out of the bullpen, he's got four pitches. Uh, they should probably try and stretch him out if he's going to use these four pitches. Like, the velocity deltas look really strong here. Legit change, legit slider, legit curveball. It's not really like a slurve or anything like that. And he's still got 92, 94 in the tank on the four-seamer. Now, we don't want to take all that much out of the values here just yet. But strike raw strikeout stuff so far in his bullpen outings, right, 31%. That's pretty attractive. Hasn't given up any power yet. That will change, of course. And we got a super short sample on him. Just 12 and a third innings here. It's mostly situational. So there, he's probably only going to go, I think, two and a third, maybe squeeze out three innings or something like that. They're going to try and stretch him out, I believe. So we can't really play him, unfortunately. He's 5,100, and he's just not going to go deep enough. Uh, and this is Cleveland. You know, if he were 4,000 at the Stone Men and you got maybe four innings out of him, he could be in play against Cleveland. Uh, but at this particular price tag I just don't think he is so unfortunately we can't really go play any of this arsenal it's a, these are attractive numbers here definitely um good strike one you know fine walk rate for a bullpen arm not a lot of chase or whatever but um it, that's still going to take me off of Cleveland I don't want to deal with them they're popping in value because they always pop in value because they're always cheap but they're they're just bad you can play Josie at 5100 pretty good price tag here and uh, sure if you want to play Gabby Arias at 2100, that's okay. If you want to play Miles Straw, 27, I, I mean, I don't. Um, so most of all, just off of these right-handers, and I don't want to play any of the lefties, they don't have any upside. So, um, again, just kind of a write-off game similar to yesterday for me for the most part. Outside of Logan Allen. Okay, let's get to the Dodgers. We get through this pretty quickly. Michael Grove on the mound, not playing him. I want to play some of the Rockies on the other side, uh, Ryan McMahon's been cold a little bit. He's 4,800, so that's not great. So he's, he, And he's coming off. The production over the last, what, month and a half or so has been excellent, but he's starting to cool off quite a bit. I don't really care, though. This is Michael Grove at uh, at Coors Field, and Michael Grove's giving up 38% hard contact to the lefties, 385 batting average allowed, 475 Woba with a 269 ISO. Now, the expected metrics, of course, quite a bit lower, 266 XBA in aggregate, 350 X Woba with a 227 X ISO. But this is still at Coors Field, and those numbers are horrendous. So let's go after it. He's got a 13% K rate against the left side. That puts... Even a very low upside bat, Jerks and Profar in play, leading off at 4,000. Zeke Tovar, you can play him still. 3,800, that's fine because he's still going to give up some pop to the righties. 262 or ISO allowed there as well with 33% hard. Neutral ground ball to fly ball with a hell of a lot of line drives to the lefties and even 19, 20% here to the right side as well. So very much attackable. Walks, um, a little bit of an issue to the left side here in a shorter sample. If he's going to walk anybody and get on the barrel at a full 10% clip with this kind of bad at ball profile, yeah, we want to go after that. So no thank you on to Michael Grove. Give me the Rockies, top to bottom, really, outside of Harold Castro. Ellery Montero probably going to strike out here a little bit. Same with Brenton Doyle. So I guess not top to bottom, just, you know, mostly 1-6 to six here. But they did just get C.J. Crone back uh, last night. He's 4600 I like this price tag. 44 for Nolan Jones. I like this a lot. He got a day off yesterday. And everybody here for the Rockies pretty well priced. I think it's a good upside tournament spot for them. Um, if it is Michael Grove, we have to see if it's actually going to. They might pull some opener shenanigans, and who knows what the hell Dave Roberts is going to do. He pulled Clayton Kershaw last night after 79 pitches, six innings, and he had faced the minimum. He walked one batter and gave up one hit, and he pulled him after six innings. So uh, who the hell knows? We're starting to get into Dave Roberts is just going to clown around with his starting pitching staff for the rest of the season. Um so keep an eye out for what they do there. Kyle Freeland on the mound for the Rockies. No thanks. Yeah, we're going to go after him mostly with righties. Now, a couple of the righties for the Dodgers are actually on the DL here, right? Chris Taylor is out. Um, they do have Johnny DeLuca in, and they've got Mookie and Will Smith and J.D. Martinez, of course. Still Miggy Vargas, right? 
Miggy Rojas if you want to play him. But, um, like, Chris Taylor is out, and he's actually a very high upside bat from the right side. So Dodgers a little bit easier to stack today than they um, were yesterday, just in terms of price tags, not necessarily in terms of the platoon. Freddie, you can play him against everybody. It doesn't really matter. But Muncy is similar to Kyle Schwarber. He is just dreadful. Um, plate discipline is fine still because he walks, but his pitch selection is garbage. Like, you cannot hit 180, 190. I don't care how much you walk. You have to make contact. He strikes out way too much, and he doesn't even hit the ball over the wall all that much. He's dealt with injuries this season. Yeah, whatever. But, like, get him out of the middle of the lineup. He is just a total corpse in there. And he makes the Dodgers stacks, um, you know, really hard to stomach a lot of the time because he's just dreadful. Certainly at 5,000. Um, even against Kyle Freeland, yeah, you could play him here because Kyle Freeland is, it has an 84% contact rate and just an 18% K rate against lefties. He's still going to give up contact and, and barrels and whatnot to both sides of the plate, but buck 80 ground ball to fly ball here to the lefties this season. He's far more attackable with the right-handers. 285 average allowed, 349 Woba with a 207 ISO, 38% hard contact, 090 ground ball to fly ball. So give me all of the Dodgers once again. 6,100 for Mookie. That's great. Uh, 56 for Will Smith is fine. JD off his two-homer night. I'm fine going back to that. Usually don't like to chase two-homer days. Really outsized performances like that. But he popped one of those balls up. And it just carried to right field. Um, he's at 52. That's a fine price. You could play any of the other righties down at the bottom. Johnny DeLuca, I do like at 2,700. And you play uh, Miggy Vargas as well. 4,000, not super thrilled about that, but uh, it's okay at, at Coors Field against Kyle Freeland. So offense only for sure at Coors tonight. Okay, let's move on to Giolito and the Angels. Um, a 9,300 for Giolito. I think he's very much in play here. Now, I, I mean, you could play Shohei tonight, and you probably should, because he hits a ball out. Every, like, he's got 13 bombs this month. Like, are you kidding me? Um, he's just out of control hot right now, incredibly locked in, and he's only 65, I say only 6,500, um, 65, 65, but you could play him against everybody in baseball right now, he is just super locked, um, Trout got a day off, you could play him too, down matchup for sure, because Giolito is exhibiting a much more traditional platoon split this season, this is what really puts Otani in play uh, tonight at 232 ISO allowed, it's a huge number, despite 25% strikeout rate, and, you know, an attractive hard contact rate. He is on the barrel a little bit to the lefty still. And that's because of the lack of really good change of value. All right, three-pitch guy here, four-seamer slider, mostly to the righties. That's the fly ball lean, right? We've talked about that a lot. And then the bad change of value, that's the power to the left-hander. So mostly attackable there with lefties. That puts Moniak and, of course, Otani, Matt Thice maybe in play. We'll see if they want to throw in like a Moustakis or Eddie Escobar. Eddie Escobar is in the player pool at 2,700 tonight. They should probably only use him against um, against left-handers, so probably not tonight, But it, so it might be a Renjifo or something like that against the, uh, in the platoon against Giolito here. Um, but I think he's in play at 9,300. The Angels we've seen over the last couple of nights, no, not last night, like Michael Kopech walked seven batters. Like, are you kidding me? Giolito didn't have near the walk problem that either Dylan Cease or Kopech have. So that puts him more in play, even at an elevated price tag compared to those two, right? Cease was 77, I believe, and Kopech was 88. But Giolito's better than both of them. So um, at least this season, he's got a lot of the hard contact and, and barrel contact under control against same-handed hitters. So that makes him far more playable. He's got whiffs again, right? 25%. This puts him in play. 9,300, I think it's fine. 15% ownership, probably fine. Don't necessarily want to get leverage on this, but I think it's okay because a lot of the guys up above him are going to see some ownership too. So I think it's very much in play here uh, going after the Angels. I don't really want to play Trout, to be honest, at 5,800. Don't really want to play any of the other righties. It would be lefties only and mostly just Shohei and a Mickey Moniak, even though Mickey Moniak probably going to strike out here too. 4200 not my favorite price tag for him. Jaime Berea on the mound for the Angels. I don't know. I guess he's got to be in play because the White Sox are garbage. This team is so bad. They have been horrific over the last month, month and a half. This 84 WRC plus is like a shockingly high number because they are terrible. 23% K rate. They still make contact, but 
honestly, this number should be far, far higher. It feels like it is, at least. 153 ISO is average. 30% hard is average, but that's mostly coming from, like, Luis Robert. He's the only one that makes any good call it, solid contact here. Um, buck 35 ground ball to fly ball, like, they are just unimpressive. They don't walk. They don't hit for average. They don't get on base. They're just terrible. So that has to put Jaime Berea in play. However, on the other side, Luis Robert is 4,600. Tim Anderson still an okay hitter. 3,800. Andrew Benintendi doesn't strike out a lot. 2,900 leading off. Eloy is 4K in the outfield. Okay, fine. Because Jaime Berea is not going to throw it past anybody. But I don't know, man. Did you really want to be playing the White Sox on a 13-game slate? They are terrible. Um, now, they're popping in value, but it's mostly because they're cheap and, and Berea is not going to throw it past them. But he doesn't walk people, and he stays off of the barrel, makes it mostly pretty difficult to stack against a lot of the time. Now, four-seamer slider, it's going to give him the fly ball lean to the right side. But so far, inducing 30% soft contact in a 100-hitter sample this year against righties. So I don't want to deal with that against a lot of these right-handers. You know, with the, with the White Sox, or with a lot of these uh, right-handers with the White Sox. So pretty much... You know, off the board for me, I think, even though they are popping in value. Um, I do like Luis Robert. He is, you know, at this point, the best hitter on the team, um, you know, for DFS purposes, that is. But 6,800 for Jaime Berea, if you land on something like this, he has 20 points in the tank, but I think he's probably capped there because of the lack of strikeout upside. Um, you know, depth-wise, he has seen a lot of his appearances come out of the bullpen, right? But in his last couple have been traditional starts, right? He's, he's seen five innings in three of these outings, um, you know, four to third in his last, or two per appearances ago, three in his last appearance against Kansas City, et cetera, et cetera. So he's somewhat stretched out here, but they might piece together a bullpen game. Could take him out of play at this particular price tag. Uh, fundamentally, though, he would be in play because the White Sox are awful. Okay, let's move on to Tampa and Arizona. And we talked about this last night. Very interesting game. Both of the starting pitchers, who I thought were in play in the main slate, got kind of picked apart. And the offenses um, really got to him, right? Arizona's a super dangerous team, man. And they've got guys up at the top of the lineup that can hit the baseball over the wall. And if Corbin Carroll's hitting it out, I mean, if it weren't for Ronald Acuna, this kid would be leading the NL in the MVP race for, right now. It, and it wouldn't be anywhere close. He, he is just an absolute stud. So that makes this whole offense incredibly difficult to go after. 10-9 for Zach Eflin. Uh, this is an egregious price tag. I'm not going anywhere near this. Now, he's been fine. 228 average allowed this season. 335 ERA. Strand rate's fine. Good whip here. Has whiffs and doesn't give up a lot of power. Doesn't walk people. But contact-wise, I'm a little suspicious about these elevated numbers here. Does have high ground balls to the righties and good ground balls to the lefties, so it's not super worrisome, right? But I think he's just flat overpriced for this particular matchup. I don't want to play. It puts him in play in tournaments, right? But I, I don't want to. I'm just going to stay off it. If I get beat by Zach Eflin at 10-9 at 5% ownership against the D-backs, uh, I just get beat. You know, I don't want to go after this team. I'd rather play some of these guys on the other side. Cattell Marte's fine, 53. 62 for Corbin Harrell is not cheap, right? But you could play him. Um, he's going to steal base. He's going to hit the baseball out. Christian Walker, too, mentioned it yesterday, really seeing the baseball over the last little while. Hit another bomb last night. 4,700. This is fine. Um, you want some fly ball and line drive hitters against Eflin, for either from the left side or the right side. So... Yeah, you can get to any of these guys really up at the top. And Jerry Perdomo, 4200 not the greatest price tag necessarily, but he's got some pop, he's got a little bit of speed, and he's dual eligible, second base and shortstop. You can get to these guys up at the top of the lineup. I think Alec Thomas is okay here. He might strike out a little bit, but uh, made some changes mechanically down in the minors, and he's 2600 in the outfield. He'll make these guys up at the top a bit cheaper for you. So I think this is fine playing some D-backs again. Not a favorite stack. They're down the list, definitely. But... This is one of the teams you might want to consider having exposure to pretty much every night in some capacity. They are very dangerous. It is a good baseball team over here, 48-32. and 32. Pretty surprising first half from the D-backs, um, given the shenanigans they've got going on, on on in the mound. Zach Davies contributing to that for sure. We're not, I'm not touching him even at 5,200. Now he's got good power suppression metrics here. 
but he pitches to too much contact for my liking. Doesn't throw it past anybody. 10.5% walk rate himself, 56% strike one, no chase, no swinging strikes, 27% CSW with a buck 80 whip here. Um, in a full eight starts this season. Now, his strand rate is incredibly low. He's got a 780 ERA with a 5.0 XFIP. But a 5.0 XFIP is still a 5.0 XFIP. I don't want to, you know, just because there's a suppression delta coming in here uh, doesn't mean I want to go after this. So maybe he'll strand some guys at a 51% strand rate. That should probably come up given that the he's not giving up a lot of power. But he's still giving up hard contact with just a neutral ground ball to fly ball here. Um, He's attackable with both sides of the plate, giving up a lot of average, 337 to the lefties so far, 276 to the righties. So the power numbers are going to come up if the hard contact number persists like this. So I, I want to go after him. This is Tampa. And I spent a lot of time on Zach Davies. I don't know why, but uh, just play Tampa. They're very, they're pretty well priced considering where they've been previously. Wander's still uh, out of control expensive. But 5,700, this is fine here. Luke Rayleigh, I like at 4,400. He sees some ownership sometimes, but he's dual eligible first in the outfield and in the three-hole. Hits righties incredibly. Uh, Randy is 59-2. That's not cheap. But he's fine. 4,500 for Josh Lowe, I like that. And the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they'll make it a little bit cheaper. Vidal Brujan is a cheap second and outfield piece for you to make it a little bit uh, less expensive. But everybody really in play here from Tampa, um, looking for their offense kind of get off Schneid here a little bit. They got to Zach Eflin last night, but they, it's been a while since they've put up a real crooked number, and I think Zach Davies could contribute in that respect. So give me offense pretty much only here. Um, I don't want to deal with Eflin's $10,000, $11,000 price tag. This is out of control. Okay, last game here. Uh, pitching probably going to be in, in play here once again. The Yankees are bad, and Oakland is bad. So, sure. Now, Domingo Herman, it, well, he really can't perform when he's not cheating, right? He needs something to increase the spin rate of his breaking stuff because his four-seamer is bad, his two-seamers just break even. Um, but it puts him in play because he gets Oakland, and they strike out hitting off a tee. So, 8000 I'm not wild about the price tag. Overall, the strikeout stuff for him, not overly impressive. He's just got those couple of outings, you know, where he's been using something, whatever it is, um, you know, that really pop is like that early season outing against Minnesota where he struck out 11 and then he got ejected a couple of starts later. I forget who it was against where he only went, what, three innings or something or two innings um, in his last two starts have, have really not been good. So, Really dragging the numbers down, right? His outing against Boston, seven earned in two innings, okay? And then his last start against Seattle, eight earned in three and a third, right? Um, so if he's not really getting spin rate on the curveball and, it, you know, lack of spin rate, I suppose, on the changeup, uh, the fastball, like, he just doesn't have it. And he'll just throw it right over the middle of the damn plate. That does put a couple of Oakland guys in play here tonight. Seth Brown in particular, J.J. Blade at 2,100. He'll likely be up, be up at the top of the lineup. Herman gives up a little bit more power to right-handers, not just lefty, but, I mean, he gives it up to both sides. And a little bit more hard contact there, so some righties, like a Brent Rooker, hopefully he gets off the schneid here soon, but he has been really, really bad over the last two months. Um, and Shea Langliers, I think those are playable right-handed pieces. You can play Asturi Ruiz, even though he's probably going to be in the bottom third of the lineup tonight. 3800 kind of a stiff price tag to convince me there, but... Up at the top, you could play Tony Kemp, you could play Ryan Noda, Blade, Brown, Rooker, Jace Peterson as well. Like, all these guys are super cheap, and they're going to pop in value, as they always do, going after Herman, But it does put him in play. Not wild about the price tag, but this is Oakland, and they're terrible. Um, 7,100 on the mound for the A's, at, at, and J.P. Sears. Um, I think he's got to be in play because the Yankees are bad too, man. They just can't create any offense. However, their price tags are even cheaper than they were yesterday, and eventually the Yankees are going to break out of this, and they're going to put up a real crooked number eventually, um, sometime soon. And it could very well be tonight because J.P. Sears has a 12.5% barrel rate. This is the highest number on the day for any starting pitcher going. A lot of fly balls makes him hard to stack against, certainly in Oakland, and with a bad offense, right? They're just not creating anything. But listen to these price tags. 49 for Glaber, that's expensive. But 36 for Bader still. 44 for Stanton now. Now we're starting to get, you know, a little bit in, intriguing here. Uh, Donaldson did hit a ball out last night. 3,200 for him. DJ, they let him off for some reason at 3,000. They're just trying to get him going. 
Guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they're super cheap as well. And you could play a Volpe or a Higgs or a Trevino or whatever behind the plate. Um, they're fine to go after J.P. Sears because of the high barrel rate here. And they're an intriguing little three-man stack. I don't think you can get there with them in full stacks necessarily. But, it, you know, it, it's hard because J.P. Sears has a lot of fly balls in him and he doesn't walk people. It's just the barrel rate and the contact that he's going to give up to the right side and the power there. So one-offs and short stacks, I think, are in play for the Yankees. Um, J.P. Sears could survive here. I don't really want to pl be playing him at this particular price tag because of this barrel rate. Um, but he's got strikeout stuff against the right side, and these guys will, will still whiff. And they're still very cold. So I guess it puts him in play a little bit. Probably not at 15% ownership, however. I think this might be a little bit aggressive for my taste. Um but both arms are in play, and some pieces offensively both in play as well. Okay, we are done here. A lot of games once again, and we've gone kind of long, so let's quickly go over a review. San Diego and Pittsburgh. Snell, yeah, I think he's fine. Probably going to come in under the ownership figure, but fundamentally I think it's fine playing him. I like some really unowned Mitch Keller here. I think he's a decent spot against Padres. Pretty shrewd tournament play. Looking for a little bit of a bounce, but um, keep, in price, keep in mind that price tag has broken down for him. Um, and it is pointing to the downside, so that could portend that um, performance may be following. Um, really no offense here in this game. Maybe a, a couple pieces here or there where they're well-priced, leverage pieces against Blake Snell or something. Since he's in Baltimore, offense only for me. Since he is an intriguing tournament stack, I think, going after Kyle Gibson because he's just like, I don't know, he's literally the definition of average. Um, but Baltimore I like a lot. Uh, in addition to the Dodgers and Texas, they're the top three stack for me today, for sure. Pretty much everybody in play there. Uh, San Francisco and Toronto, um, I'm mostly on the Giants here, going after Trevor Richards. We'll have to see what they do if it is him on the mound. Um, unlikely to go very long, but I like the Giants going after his two pitches here. He's got a fastball, and he's got a changeup, and that's, uh, that's really it. So no pitching. Uh, from Toronto's perspective, maybe a little bit of Logan Webb here. I think he's in play. Don't like the price tag necessarily going after Toronto, and it's a tough matchup. Um, but I, he is in play at his ownership, you know, whatever, sub 10% here. Uh, Toronto, I'm really just not interested in uh, pretty much top to bottom. Uh, maybe a Brandon Belt dual eligible, you know, well-priced at 3000 Danny Jansen, fly ball hitter, yeah, or Matt Chapman, maybe, but like, eh. Not super thrilled about that. Milwaukee and the Mets, uh, pretty much off of Milwaukee. I think they're similar to the Padres here. and They're a bad offense. And they get a respectable arm in Kodai Senga. He just walks too many people for me to play him in DFS above 10,000. No thanks. Um, Wade Miley, he might be able to survive here. It might put him in play in super deep tournament stacks, or uh, teams, rather. Um, against a pretty poor offense, but well-priced Mets are also in play because Miley does still give up uh, a little bit of pop to the right side. Miami and Boston. Miami in play once again. Boston in play once again because Braxton Garrett unlikely to go more than probably six innings unless he's really rolling, and that seems pretty unlikely against a pretty high upside offense from the right side of the plate targeting Braxton Garrett's problems and hard contact issues uh, to right-handers. Um like Boston short stacks for sure, but you can full stack this game um, pretty much you know either side. So I'm going to stay off of pitching, just a bullpen game here for the Red Sox. Um, yeah, Braxton Garrett, I guess, is in play because he's got upside for sure, but um, you know, we have depth questions, or at least I do. Houston, St. Louis, I want offense only in this game. No Michaelis, not even close. Huge line drive right here. Give me some Houston for sure. They're top five stack for me, I believe. And no Javier. I want to get to a little bit of Cardinals. They're an off-the-board stack because um, their offense is kind of, you know, really struggling and flatlining here over the last several weeks. But, um, you know, really decent batted ball matchup here. Power upside uh, for sure for a lot of these guys against Javier. Detroit and Texas. Less enthused about Detroit today than I was in the last couple of days. Um, maybe a Kerry Carpenter here against Dane Dunning. Dane, Dunning's got to be in play. Uh, he's going to see a little bit of ownership, but we have real upside concerns with him. Um, you know, this is Detroit. They're bad. It's okay. And all of the Texas, if I can get him against Joey Wentz. Philly and Chicago, Aaron Nola, I'm, I'm just not interested. Same thing with Drew Smiley. Um, do I, I don't really want to stack against Nola. Maybe take a piece here or there. And I want to go after Drew Smiley if I can, here or there. 
Um, Alec Bohm for sure, and you know Nick Castellanos, Trey Turner, like them from the right side, definitely. And Harper, of course. Schwarber, eh, right, not so much. Cleveland KC, um, Logan Allen on the mound, think he's in play for sure, and really kind of off of offense. I think these offenses are just dreadful. And I respect the opener capacity of, of Austin Cox here. Um, he might be stretched out for three and four innings, and that takes me off of Cleveland. Um, outside of Jose Ramirez, Dodgers, of course. Colorado definitely against Michael Grove. If, if it is him, then yeah, the offense only uh, outside of that. But everybody is in play in this game at Coors Field. Of course, it's very warm at Coors tonight, I believe. Um, checking the temp real quick. Uh, yeah, yeah. North of 85 degrees, so uh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, White Sox Angels, mostly just Giolito, no offense here for me outside of Otani, of course. Um, and none of the White Sox, I think they're garbage. Jaime Berea would be in play if he's going to go deep enough, but uh, yeah, I don't know, 6,800 with those depth questions, probably not. Tampa and Arizona, no Eflin or Zach Davies for me, and some deep tournament offense here uh, for sure. Uh, absolutely with Tampa, I, I think they're right up there as a top five stack um, targeting Zach Davies here tonight. And, and you could play Arizona too, going after Zach Eflin. He's, he's way overpriced. Uh, Yankees and Oakland pitching is in play here for both of these guys. Offense in play for the Yankees, mostly because of price tags and the barrel rate from JP Sears, Oakland, because they're super, super cheap. And Domingo Herman stinks when he can't cheat. So that's it. We are done. Good luck to everybody on the big 13 game main tonight. Um, We'll be back for Thursday. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership pushes as they will change throughout the day. Good luck.